and the participant is uh yes they will have to so what happens if you write the ask <laughs> then it will speak so you can rename it you can go to there are three dots on your uh, uh, on your window you can go there and there is a option for rename so if you rename right. it becomes more easy. yes okay yes it's a good now yes uh who's there for uh, technical support from intas rohit are you there <clears throat> rohit or prashant are you there yes sir yeah so i'm going to start now you can run it live on youtube okay yes sir we are live on youtube also sir. yes sir done sir okay uh so uh good morning good evening good afternoon everyone uh, i welcome you all uh, to uh, this uh, webinar so from today onward the hns yns committee has taken effort uh, to stretch our efforts for the education and we have done a collaboration let me i think it's okay now okay so we have uh, sort of made some collaboration with uh, uh, young neurosurgeons from south america and caribbean countries and uh, that is the way we are trying to stretch our efforts for the education in neurosurgery so today we have uh, professor najia albadi from morocco and who is uh, uh, won the election for the president recently we all congratulate her for that being the first female president of uh, wfns and first president from africa and that's very proud moment for us and i definitely hope that she will support all the young neurosurgeons and the training of young neurosurgeons in future uh, our next speaker is uh, professor takeshi hara a dynamic young spine neurosurgeon from japan we have along with us our chief patron professor yoko kato and the two chair person uh, professor yugo andrew and uh, professor federico sale from uruguay along with that i have four moderators with me from south america and caribbean dr rolando from peru dr maria from uruguay dr nujerling a good friend of mine from dominican republic and dr karin aponte from bolivia so with that allow me to introduce a short introduction of professor najia elabadi she is the wfns president elect 2021 23 she is the head of department of neurosurgery sheikh zayed international university hospital rabat morocco she is the chairman of department of surgery abul kois international university of health sciences rabat morocco she is also director of stereotactic brain surgery university diploma she is the president of pan arab association of neurosurgical societies she is also treasurer of continental association of african neurosurgical societies and middle east spine society board member she is a past president of mediterranean association of Neuros neurological surgeons and past president of moroccan society of neurosurgery and also a past chairman of wfns win committee 2013 2017 so with that small introduction i hand over the screen to professor najia we welcome you all and we again congratulate you for uh, being elected as a new uh, president elect of 2021 23 thank you very much professor uh, dr sachin so dr hugo will introduce najia or i i have already introduced her so yeah. maybe be, uh. before uh, before starting may i request uh, dr hugo and uh, dr uh, uh, federico to say few words and after that professor yoko kato can say few uh, words of encouraging for young neurosurgeon and then we'll start uh, with our uh, webinar so professor yugo and professor federico can you say few words yeah um thank you very much for the invitation and also thank you to professor kato for organizing this um webinar um trying to promote education and um training to young neurosurgeons of South America and the Caribbean. This is one of the good things that maybe we had been forgetting a little bit in the last couple of years during the pandemic. So I'm looking forward to these sessions and also to hear the, the talk from uh, Professor uh, Nadia Alabadi about brainstem carinomas. 
I guess after the talk, we can um, discuss a little bit with other people and, and also with the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hugo, for uh, being with us. Professor Federico, you want to say something? Yes, I also want to congratulate Professor Nadja El Abadi on behalf of the Uruguayan Society of Neurosurgery. We are very proud of, of her election and looking forward to, to continue with these activities that are very important for the education of, of, of young neurosurgeons. So I'm very happy to be here and I hope this, this kind of activities will continue. So you can count on us. And now I'm also eager to, to listen to, to the conference. So we can, we can discuss later. Thank you for your invitation. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Dr. Federico. I uh, would request Professor Yoko Kato to say a few encouraging uh, words for the young neurosurgeon and then we'll start the... Uh, Thank you very much. So uh, welcome all of you. I think uh, so the, the today we'll have a new version of the YNS uh, webinar. So we choose uh, especially in a nice country from the Caribbean and also Latin America. Of course, the Afghanistan or Myanmar, uh, those uh, uh, team still uh, there joining us, I think. So we have a very much looking forward to the two big uh, speakers uh, lectures. Thank you very much for today's uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Over to you, Professor Nadia. You can uh, start your lecture now. OK. So thank you very much, uh, dear, uh, dear, dear friend. And um, really, it's my pleasure and a great honor to be one of the guest speakers today uh, with the all friends. Uh, I hope I, if I could, I welcome you here in Rabat to share this uh, next meeting in person, but the COVID-19 uh, make it impossible for the moment, but so we make it possible at least virtually uh, as today. And uh, of course, first of all, I would like to express my deep thanks to Professor Yoko Tkato and all her amazing team uh, uh, for this, uh, for your kind invitation and warm welcome to attend this great webinar series, especially for young neurosurgeons. I'm very happy to be here today, at least virtually, because at the uh, as the majority uh, of you, you know that one pillar of my program for my election as president-elect in the, of WFNS is to, is to continue what predecessors done as uh, uh, like as uh, Yoko and many, many others pioneers for a young neurosurgeon. And um, it's one of my pillar in the, of my program. Uh, it's, uh, non, non, uh, it's, uh, it's to continue this, uh, the, this program, the, the education and the development uh, of young neurosurgeon uh, committee in the WFNS. And of course, uh, establish and develop strong committee uh, uh, in the in the future uh, in the WFNS for young neurosurgeon and associate them to all committee to uh, to, to all the others committee. Uh, each uh, committee should be have uh, one or two young neurosurgeon. This is one of the pillar of my program. And again, thank you so much for your congratulations. And I know. Uh, most of you uh, uh, support my candidacy, and for that, my deep thanks again. So uh, today, uh, I will uh, I will talk about the brainstem cavernoma, uh, and uh, of course, as we know, all of us, that is a special and challenging uh, uh, challenging topic. Uh, the first case uh, of surgical brainstem cavernoma with the favorable evolution was published by Dandy in 1928. 20, 20, but it's only in the last decades the successful microsurgical series are reported in the literature with decrease in morbidity and mortality with at least accept acceptable rate. Actually, the natural history is better now, but the brainstem uh, uh, cavernoma still a subject, a subject of controversy because it is a highly functional area, as obviously you know. 
I will quickly uh, pass on these notion, notions, notions known all of all of you. One fourth uh, of are located in a uh, frontotemporal with the predilection and the brainstem. The pons represent elect elective location, as is uh, shown on this slide. Most of brainstem cavernoma are located in the pons, usually posteriorly near the floor of the fourth ventricle and easily more accessible to surgery, uh, hopefully. So clinical finding of brainstem cavernoma are very heterogeneous. The beginning of symptoms can be brutal, brutal with the appearance of one of several associated symptoms. Sometimes the progressive clinical worsening might stimulate a tumor. These forms need usually surgical treatment. And the typical aspect in MRI is a popcorn image. I think, you know, uh, all of you, uh, this image is a very, very uh, atypical. And you see here, hyper, hyper intercentral is spotted in T1 and T2 with hypo intense peripheral zone. Sometimes you can see atypical of hypo signal in T1 and T2 with more mass effect and perilesional uh, edema or abnormal vessel drainage. It's very important to know that before surgery to predict the surgical difficulties. So the, this cl classification is very old, but very uh, per, uh, relevant. It's very interesting because according to the location from subarachnoid and cistern, we can choose the appropriate therapeutic decision and also the best approach indicate in each uh, location. So we have just studied the specificity degree of radiological diagnosis, diagnosis and therefore we have to estimate the risk of neurological injury, neuro, neurological injury due to bleeding or re-bleeding of the lesion, the lesion without any treatment. So the therapeutic management depends on a couple comparison between spontaneous evolution, evolution and the associated risk to different therapeutics. The natural history of all location of cavernomas underline the fact that the rebleeding after a first hemorrhagic episode is more frequent earlier and more important. Currently, it is well demonstrated that the hemorrhage is more frequent in deep cavernoma and the forms which is associated with venous, venous malformations. The high rate of neurological events and the low rate of satisfactory recovery explains more the surgical attitude uh, currently, and especially with encouraging results of recent cavernoma surgical series in this location. According to this uh, natural history, what are the therapeutic options? We will see some of that. Surgical excision is the best treatment of cavernomas, of course. But it's still a big challenge for neurosurgeon in this, especially in this location. We will see why and how to manage it uh, in the, in the good, good way. When surgery is recommended, which surgical approach should we choose? Which, uh, uh, which safety zone, uh, entry safety zone have to, to, to choose also? And there are various access to brainstem cavernoma surgically approaches but according to their location, of course. First, we uh, use uh, uh, the median sub approach uh, in the MAC the, uh, most of the time, but sometimes the retrosigmoidal approach the, or the subtemporal transtortorial approach, which leads to the anterolateral side of mesencephal and uh, uh, pons, then at, uh, at last, uh, we, have, we can use also the supracerebellar infratontorial approach, which is rarely used for posterior mesencephal. So I have chosen to illustrate these different approaches by some, by some, some, some cases from our series. Uh, we, uh, we, uh, we have today uh, 24 patients. Uh, between 2005 to 2018, because before 2005 we never start, we never try to uh, operate these patients before, because uh, the the lack of uh, tools and also the um, I think it's uh, at that time uh, may, uh, uh, not 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 a uh, uh, numerous uh, neurosurgeon can uh, take can take in charge this this uh, this locations. 
So first, I will show you some cases which uh, focuses mainly on sub-acceptal -sub approach, and secondly, on the meritrosegmoidal approach. The first patient is chosen for this, his particular symptoms revealed by tumor syndrome. Uh, it concerns a 32-year-old uh, young man who presented six months before his hospitalization, headache, diplopia, walk and trouble, and swelling disorder. I would like to tell you a funny but really story concerning uh, this first patient. When I told him about the risk of the surgery uh, in this particular location, he ran away three times from the operating room. Each time he would find himself in the, himself in the operating room, he would run back to his place uh, bed. And the only time we were able to operate in, on, on him was when we dragged him in his bed and dragged him to, to the operating theater. So the initial MRI showing a big cavernoma, as you see here, see, see here, and with the mass effect on the fourth ventricle, surgery performed in the sitting position has enabled uh, in, uh, able to uh, the complete resection of the cavernoma. Here are some photo of per operative view the bed of cavernoma because at that time uh, the the record uh, it was was filled filled in the in the final. Uh, uh, we, when we, did, we finished the, the operation. So I will take just photography here and you do say the bed and the cavernoma, uh, the, the pieces of the cavernoma. So the evolution was really very favorable with a, a gradual regression of all the symptoms. MRI, and you see here the diplopia, no diplopia after uh, I think one week after the surgery and the, the MRI here showed the complete resection. The second case, uh, which I would like to illustrate uh, uh, with the, this, uh, this uh, talk, is the other clinical form, which is hemorrhage uh, syndrome. It concerns a 54 years old woman hospitalized in emergency for sudden onset of agitation state, uh, diplopia, and walk and trouble. Initial MRI shows a pontine hematoma, as you see here. And the patient underwent an MRI one uh, month after, and uh, after, of, of course, the bleeding, which shows another nodular lesion here. It's the cavernoma. We, uh, we uh, followed the, the patient for one month because uh, uh, at that time, it's uh, not easy for us to, uh, to choose a surgery, but when uh, uh, after one month after the bleeding uh, resor resorption of the, bl the blood, we uh, saw, see, uh, re re we see uh, here the, the cavernoma and we decide to operate her because the bleed, the re-bleeding and uh, it's more important in the location as, as, I, as I mentioned in the beginning. So the surgery performed one month later because the risk of re-bleeding led to the complete removal of the cavernoma. The patient received two control MRI, uh, performed one at six months and the other one at 16 months. Uh, you see here that hair. And, uh, um, and the, the, operation, the operation which have objectified a total removal of uh, cavernoma is in this uh, MRI. On this slide, the first two images illustrate, illustrates the MRI image of the voluminous bleeding in the pontine cavernoma of young 17, 17 years old teenagers who had dramatic symptoms with, uh, which obliged us to operate on him uh, in emergency. We performed total removal of cavernoma and evacuation of hematoma. Here you see post-operative uh, uh, MRI uh, control with the total cleaning of the lesion. The patient had a good evolution after six months of rehabilitation. You see here the, the just the, the no lesion before after that. Oh, what happened? Okay. In this case, you see uh, the other location of medulla oblonga and the cavernoma, which was reached by the sub-accipital approach, the MRI before surgery, showed the, uh, look, the, the, the lesion. And the second one is uh, the typical 
typical of cavernoma of uh, shows a typical image of cavernoma. The second one is per operative picture showing a sub a superficial location. Uh, the last three are post-operative MRI showing the thorough removal of the lesion here. But this is uh, the film of uh, a video, a small video of uh, the uh, how to reach this uh, location by the telovelar approach here. And I hope that uh, the I hope that you see very uh, yes here we uh, open the 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 the, the medulla oblonga because we saw uh, uh, on the on the superficial uh, 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 the the some some signs of the cavernoma and we uh, uh, remove it here piece by piece because it was a very um, very important very vo voluminous uh, cavernoma so we uh, uh, fragmented fra we 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 remove it with the fragmentation and finally we uh, uh, just uh, uh, inspected all the, ca the the cavity if there is no uh, more uh, pieces of cavernoma and uh, it's it's uh, the total removal is uh, is performed was performed Okay, so here you see anterolateral cavernoma of the pons here and the MRI before, MRI after, but here the, the, the video we show you we, with, of course, uh, uh, neural navigation, retrosigmoid approach. We will see, uh, we see uh, the first, the seven, the, 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 seven, the, the, the fifth nerves and the, the seven and eight nerves here, between the two nerves, we uh, uh, open the, um, the pons and we see here the, the, the cavity of the cavernoma. We also here uh, remove it with the fragmentation and at the, the end of operation, we uh, inspect all the cavity to see if there is uh, if there is still some some pieces of the of the, the this and you see here the, uh, the the cavity between the seven and eight and the low, low, lower uh, cranial nerves and the cavity of uh, of uh, of cavernoma here and the control you see here the control after it's a very good control and the evolution of the patient was very good also. So in this slide, uh, there, is, there are two cases where only subtemporal approach can be used. You can imagine here is not is the only one sub uh, sub uh, approach can use it. Subtemporal, so, sorry, some uh, use it can use it. The first one is uh, MRI showing a small mesencephalic cavernoma here. And we decide at that time when when uh, when we had we see this uh, cavernoma, it's uh, really by by pure chance. And five years after that, he sudden uh, cl clinical worsening with contralateral neurological deficit took place. The following MRI image reveals here the bleeding of this uh, small cavernoma uh, and posing emergency surgery. The question is. Uh, should we operate this patient before bleeding, knowing that the, that he was almost asymptomatic? To, to to make this decision is really very difficult. I, we will can uh, discuss it uh, before. The second the second cases you see in an anteroaxial mesencephalic cavernoma here. And MRI shows a heterogeneous aspect of the central, uh, the central uh, signal with a, a hyposignal ring. The sequence without gadolinium enhancement showing hyper uh, uh, intense uh, signal and the lesion related to recent hemorrhage. And the uh, sequence with the gadolinium show showing linear contrast enhancement in the medial part of the lesion suggestion and associated here, as you see, uh, AVD, uh, the, uh, venous development of abnormality. When we explain the risk of uh, surgery to the patient, re she refused the, the operation. And we have a two years uh, follow uh, till now with the stab stable neurological status, but I don't know what will happen in the future. I hope that she will change his, his, his uh, mind and uh, uh, accept the, the operation. It's, I think it's more, more safer for her. So here, um, surgical technique in this uh, cavernoma in this situation has the same imperative. First, the incision has to be along the axis of mesencephalic fiber. 
the knowledge of the anatomy. Anatomy is very important here. And the safety entry zone is a crucial, uh, a cr crucial for, surgery, for surgery in this location. First, we, we uh, have to, uh, to uh, we should to, uh, in, uh, start with evocation of the hematoma if there is, of course, the bleeding. And uh, then uh, we, uh, start, we continue with the, uh, the fragmentation uh, the, with the, of, the, of the, the cavernoma because usually it's, uh, it's a big size, but it's, it's, when it's a small one, we can, we can took it uh, 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 on one piece, but usually we need to fragment it, uh, fragment it the, the, the cavernoma in many pieces before, uh, before uh, remove it. Uh, respect of associated small malformations in this uh, in the peripheral area of cavernoma is very important. And some publication mentioned last, uh, that it, is, it should be to uh, achieve radical excision involves the removal of the pre-lesional gly gliosis may uh, sometimes contain satellite expansion of cavernoma. In my opinion, it's very dangerous and not necessary to perform that in this high functional area. Uh, there is no recommendation for the timing of surgery unless emergency situation where the life is threatened like bleeding with the conscious trouble as I uh, show you in some cases. It, se it seems that it depends on the habit of surgeon more than on scientific data. In fact, we are often surprised by the delay between the moment of diagnosis and of symptomatic lesions and their <coughs> surgical treatment that can, that can go from uh, some days to several year, weeks. And the time of reflection of neurosurgeon, of course, and also of patients concerning this critical area is very decided about this uh, time. So, uh, uh, this is an uh, algorithm uh, uh, about the surgical treatment of, ca um, in the, of cavernomas in this lo location. The surgical indication depends on the symptomatic character of cavernoma, of course. No surgery when there are no symptoms, but when we, there is a stable neuro neurological deficit, it relies uh, on a Karnofsky, of course, score. Is Karnofsky uh, uh, more than 60, we can uh, we can wait. But if if, uh, if, if it's less than, uh, 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 less than 60, surgery is indicated. So the literature results are very encouraging now, and we met many uh, many <coughs> surgeons well known around the world. Uh, 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 with this field, uh, especially Professor Bertalanfi uh, from uh, from Germany during many many meetings, and he was more optimistic optimist about the latest result of his series. Here are some data emerging of uh, some articles uh, uh, which uh, ha which have uh, uh, more. Uh, 86 uh, uh, cases, it's a huge, uh, it's important uh, study. And Bertalanfi, now I think he had more than uh, 100 uh, brainstem cavernoma, but the uh, data and, uh, and the, when the, the last one, the article published by him is uh, 72 deep cavernoma and 34, 34 brainstem cavernoma. But I know, but now it's more than that. And uh, in his, um, in his uh, uh, theory, he had, he had no zero mortality, but of course, 29 uh, morbidity and uh, in post-operative, immediately post-operative, and 5.5% long term. And in our theory, we had two, uh, two cases uh, of, uh, more, uh, more, uh, of that, and we have le less than 15% of the, the, of the morbidity at uh, long, long, long term. So I hope uh, that I'm not very, and not take a lot of time. I will finish uh, by this uh, uh, two uh, take uh, take home message. The brainstem cavernoma is serious affection with the natural history which exposed to major neurolog neuros neurological sequel. The selection of candidate for surgical treatment is an important as the surgical technique itself, whose recent advances Better, better knowledge of surgical approaches, 
the, the notion of the uh, entry safe, safe, uh, safety zone, neuronavigation, microsurgery, uh, uh, monitoring in a per operative monitoring uh, and others, other tools uh, help to reduce the morbidity. And the decision to intervene surgically in the brainstem is very difficult in daily practice. Surgery should be reserved for, for the forms of progressive worsening deficit and hemorrhagic forms. Its aim should be complete resection of the lesion, of course. So thank you very much for your uh, listening and I hope that I can uh, uh, answer all your questions. And uh, uh, again, thank you very much for your support and for your uh, warm welcome and congrat congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, for that uh, excellent talk and taking some controversial points and showing us some wonderful cases about some uh, exceptional uh, deep brainstem gliomas, uh, brainstem cavernomas, and their surgical strategies. Uh, I would first uh, uh, request uh, Dr. Hugo and Dr. Federico to uh, uh, chair the session and uh, say a few words about their experiences and about the controversies about the brainstem cavernoma. Uh, over to you, Dr. Hugo, can you speak first? Yeah, All right. Thank you very much, Professor Nadia. That was a great talk. Um, and you touched many interesting uh, topics and points. One of the things that also that we consider and it should be considered during surgery is age of the patient. Because as you can see in the series from Professor uh, Nadia, most of the patients that they underwent surgery, they were young patients. Because you won't offer treatment to these kind of lesions when you have a very old patient because you know the chances of recovering are very uh, low compared to the outcome. And the other thing is that we always consider is whether the patient has a neurological deficit or if it's just an incidental uh, finding. We, because we know about the natural history, if it's just incidental finding about uh, brainstem lesions, it takes around 7% chances of, of um, bleeding within the five years. But if you have a hemorrhagic presentation or a neurological deficit, it would take 30% risk of having bleeding within the next five years. So this is something important. And as Professor Nadia mentioned before, we really need to know the anatomy that we are, of the lesion that we're treating and that we're dealing with. Um, this is very important. I just wanted to ask you, um, one thing that we always consider is not to offer surgery from the very first moment. And uh, even though acute cases, it's easier to, to remove the, the hematoma and the carinoma, but we also, like you, we prefer to, to wait a couple of weeks when there is just sort of acute phase and then we go through the lesion. And um, I don't know if it's in, in your hospital is a, is a norm to use new monitoring during surgery. Okay, thank you for your uh... Question is very relevant, and uh, the first one uh, it's about why we don't operate some uh, some emergency cases because uh, we choose. Uh, it depends on the clinical fi finding, uh, as you really uh, judicially said. It's uh, always uh, it's always the young people, so we need to uh, to think uh, really a lot before to, to go to surgery because we know that uh, it's not easy surgery. It's not done by uh, 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 every surgeon. Uh, we need the surgeon uh, dedicated to this uh, surgery. This is the first thing. And the second thing, if, the, if you are the, the uh, face on acute uh, uh, cases with the uh, worse, very worse uh, clinical finding. We, we, we can go to the surgery because you are not, uh, nothing to, to lose. If uh, you can uh, help him, it's, it's good, but it's not, it's, it's all already in the clinic, in, 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 the, in worse in uh, deficit and uh, uh, maybe sometimes in the Glasgow comma scale, uh, uh, less than uh, seven of seven. But when we had a patient uh, also without, uh, with a small clinical finding, in this, in this case also it's, it depends on the, in the, clic the clinical fi finding. It is a small, a small or little, little bit of symptoms. We uh, prefer to, 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 uh, 
to wait. Uh, and and uh, one month after uh, uh, performing another MRI to see really the, the, the size of the cavernoma and the location between, uh, between the pale, uh, the, the, it's the superficial or, or uh, more deeply, it's very important for the surgery. Because when the when the, the the hemorrhage is a is it is small, we need to we need to see where is the the cavernoma, and this is very important. And the second question is, um, sorry, I uh, I lose my. It was about the neo monitoring. Ah uh, yeah yeah of course now we use it uh, uh, from uh, three four year four, four years now we use it systematically of course but the uh, most of the ca the cases that I show you there are no motoring at the time we did, we don't we didn't have it at the time and now we we use it uh, we use it we use it uh, every day. I think also it's important to mention for young neurosurgeons, like you said, there has to be somebody who is really dedicated to this area and to try or to deal with these lesions and not everybody should do it. Uh, I, I, I show you in my, uh, in my, in our study, uh, we start mm -hmm. in two, 2005 and you know that I am, I am more than, <laughs> I am more uh, eager than that because uh, I start brainstem cover, a surgery of brainstem cavernoma when I was, uh, I think at least uh, 20 years of neurosurgery. Can you imagine? This is why for, uh, 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 thank you for your message, for young neurosurgeon, we need to 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 see this 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 uh, surgery with the with the senior surgeons, and we we need to know very very well. And I'm uh, emphasizing that uh, every time. Uh, it's not uh, it's not specifically to the to the to the this surgery, but uh, usually for all the surgery as a skull base, it's the anatomy. The knowledge of the anatomy is the key for this uh, surgery to, to achieve this surgery without. Uh, uh, morb morbidity or uh, mortality at least, uh, at, le at least uh, with a low rate. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you, Professor Nadja, for your great talk. And uh, we totally agree. This is a very challenging and interesting surgery. <clears throat> Here in, in Uruguay, we have many cases. I've had the, the opportunity to, to assist Professor Spagnolo Who's, who's, ha, she, he has been doing this for 40 years now. And as you said, the, the knowledge of the anatomy is, is the key. And regarding that point, I must say that I don't really trust neuronavigation. I know it sounds very technological and, and interesting, but I think that when, when you open the fourth ventricle, then there, there's a brain shift that, that is considerable. And uh, of course, it, it's a good tool and it helps. But if you know the anatomy first, I, I agree that that's the most important thing. And um, I also wanted to add that um, we use systematically some sequences in MRI, susceptibility weighted images, SWI, to diagnose the, the cavernomas. And many times we find multiple cavernomas that um, in, in ancient times or with, with other um, types of sequences in MRIs, you wouldn't have diagnosed. So I wanted to ask how you manage multiple cavernomas when you find them. Um, what's the indication for, for surgery? And um, well, that, that's my first question. I'll ask some other questions later. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm. Uh, it's. Um, it's. Uh, I'm uh, re really happy to know that uh, Professor Hispaniolo uh, is uh, doing well, and you are uh, training with him. I. I. I, I have uh, really uh, uh, a be, uh, great, great uh, friendship uh, to him. Uh, two, years, two, two yeah. years. Four years. So uh, about the multiple cavernomas, it's. Um, Usually, when you have a multiple cavernomas, it's uh, it's it's a disease. It's not it's not it's not only lesion. So uh, usually, we respect it if there is no no uh, uh, symptom. It's uh, incidental, as you say. Of course, we respect this this uh, this uh, this cavernomas. And usually, it's uh, asymptomatic. I have many patients. 
like this, I think uh, more than 10 patients that I'm following their, them uh, without, with the a, a, a temporal one, He's, uh, uh, he, he had epilepsy and uh, I uh, follow him with, with uh, just a med tra medical treatment. And the others, they have, oh, I have one friend, big friend to me with uh, more than, uh, I think uh, 15 or 20 uh, cavernomas. And uh, she is uh, now uh, more than uh, 60 years and uh, she, never, uh, she never had anything. So the multiple cavernomas and the history, the natural history of the, uh, of the multiple cavernomas is very different, totally different from one lesion. And we know uh, in, the, in the deep situation, like uh, this location, I mean, uh, uh, brain caver brainstem cavernoma, it's, uh, it's, not, it's well known that it's more, uh, more, uh, it's, there are more bleeding with this location than others, uh, especially in, uh, sub in, in subtantorial uh, lo locations. Mm. Yes. And in my opinion, we need to follow it. But uh, when there is some some, I think it's very, very rare that there is, a, when you have multiple cavernoma, is there is bleeding or symptomatic. Yeah, we agree. And then I will ask one more question for, for young neurosurgeons that maybe might be wondering if radio surgery can be useful for these lesions. Uh, I, I have my opinion and I, I think I know the answer, but I wanted to comment. Uh, I wanted you to comment on, on this um, yeah. therapeutic option also. You. you know, we had, uh, we had a, a team in, uh, in Rabat uh, the first gamma knife in Africa is in Morocco in Rabat, and they won the two uh, guys who is uh, taken in charge of this uh, discipline is what was, was, was my my training. So we had uh, every week uh, uh, one uh, one uh, meeting about uh, the indication for uh, for some particular uh, particular uh, uh, lesions. And my opinion personally about the cavernoma, radio surgery for, for me, it's, uh, there is no indication for, 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 for cavernoma. This is my opinion. But with my, my, my team, I have uh, Professor Malhawi and uh, Professor Arha, they are, uh, they are making uh, radio surgery. And uh, sometimes we had a uh, long, long discussion about that. And uh, I try to, con they try to convince me to, uh, when we, 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 when it's, uh, of, co of course, asymptomatic brain stain. And they told me, no, madam, we will can do the radio surgery. And I, so I told him, how, how much you, uh, you will give him uh, as, uh, as, uh, as radiotherapy in the brainstem and you are sure it, it, it will be safer for them. So uh, I, 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 I block them uh, uh, sometimes, but they have, they have some uh, cases, but uh, no, really, there is, there, there is no difference. Maybe they are told me, told me, talk, talk, told me, Madam, you are in the literature. It's uh, uh, stopping the bleeding, but it's really, it's. Uh, I'm not sure. It's, uh, it's, it's true. Totally agree. At your Thank opinion, you. you are for or <laughs> it's against? The same. No, no, there's no indication for radio surgery. Okay. The, so the only option is we have the same opinion. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. I, I have one question on just that, that point since we are discussing about radio surgery. So, see, we have observed uh, some patients when we're doing uh, brainstem cavernomas and the intraoperative monitoring is on. And when you are removing the brainstem cavernoma in pieces, and suddenly the intraoperative monitoring physiology says that no, there is a drop in MEP. So, maybe that small portion of cavernoma, you may just cauterize and leave behind because it's totally stuck on the brain stem. And if you remove, there can be more drop in MEB. So would that conservative approach later may cause, there are enough evidence that says that if you leave behind some strawberries of those cavernoma, it may recur later. So would you still advise no radiation for those small bits of cavernoma or any small bits of cavernoma which is by chance left behind you, you're not seen through what is I just as a point of discussion? <laughs> okay, so uh, first, the, the 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 best uh, the best uh, of course uh, treatment is the the, the to total and complete removal. Not, you, you 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 don't you don't, and you you should uh, no uh, remnant uh, in in the in the in the 
after surgery. But uh, as you said, uh, sometimes you have some problem with the monitor or the physiologist or your anesthesiologist who is saying, oh, please, there's bradycardia, you have to stop. So you have just to manage the things. Uh, slowly, we stop the operation for uh, some, some minutes and then continue. You, you will see that it's, uh, it's better. This is the, 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 the answer for your, the, first, uh, the first question. The second, uh, uh, it, it, the, the radio surgery is, does, doesn't work with cavernoma. Even the pieces after surgery, remnant after surgery, or the first time directly. It's, uh, in my opinion, there are no indication for radio surgery to, for, the, for the cavernomas. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Professor. I agree with you. So we have some questions from a uh, lot of young neurosurgeons, and a lot of them are new. Even I have not spoken with them over the phone. I, I don't know their faces. So please go ahead. I see some hand raised there. Please uh, introduce yourself and ask your questions, please. Uh, Dr. Ndujering is there. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Um, Abadi, for your great conference. I would like to know now with the new technology like endoscope and those kind of new things, I would like to know if you have any experience doing by approach by endoscope, removing the cavernoma. Okay, Hello. yes. Uh, usually we use the endoscopy in the skull base, uh, skull base surgery, uh, especially in the APC, ECP angle uh, with the tumor in this, uh, this area because uh, we are never uh, be sure that we uh, the, the complete resection is done. So in the uh, in the cavernoma is uh, the, the cavity is uh, is is small. So you don't have you don't need endoscopy, especially in this location. I'm I'm talking about the location and the brainstem cavernoma, not in the other uh, location. But in in, in in this location, you don't need the endoscopy because the the cavity is is small, and you need to as a, you you have no uh, angle uh, different uh, angle. You need uh, to see. Uh, uh, under some uh, uh, some cranial nerves or some uh, uh, arteries or like this, That's the, the, because a cavernoma, as you know very well, it's intraparenchymal uh, lesion and uh, it's small uh, small small uh, a small corridor. So you don't you don't need to, uh, to use endoscopy in this uh, this location, especially in this location. I'm I'm saying. But for others location, yes, we can use it if, uh, if we have, if, if, if when we have some doubt about the uh, complete resection, the endoscopy is this, the excellent tools for, for, uh, for to be sure that you are achieving your uh, total removal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Even more hundred, Dr. Reddy is there. Uh, Dr. Reddy, can you introduce yourself and ask your question? Uh, Professor Abadi, thank you so much for your talk. It was very informative. Um, I am a neurosurgery resident in the United States. Um, a question that I had for you was, what do you quote as the re-hemorrhage rate for brainstem cavernomas that have already hemorrhaged once? Because there, there's obviously some discretion in the literature. Um, some, And I've heard people say, you know, three to 5%, some say 30%. So what do you quote your patients as the rehemorrhage rate per year? Uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting question because the, 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 the you know, the range is very, uh, is very uh, large in the literature as you judiciary just says. And in my experience, I think it's uh, uh, between, I think it's uh, uh, more than 50% 50, 50 per year. It's um, um, between the, the five to 30%. I think 30% is too much, is so much. Maybe some, 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 some authors uh, uh, reported that in the literature, but uh, in my opinion, it's uh, about, uh, about 15, 16, 17%, not, 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 not uh, more than that. Thank you. At least in my, in my, in my theory, we are 15%. But uh, when I review the literature, 
uh, of course, we, we need to report the, 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 the highest one and the, the, the lowest, lowest one. But uh, uh, usually it's uh, not more than 20%. Uh, but some series report 50%. So you need to, uh, to specify that in the literature. But it's uh, between 10, 10 to 15, 17% per year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. I think the controversy in the literature about the rate of dream bleed about cavernoma is because different age group has got different uh, percentage of bleeds. So that's why it depends on which center, which percentage of age group they have seen. So that's why it reflects different. Uh, any other question from the delegates for the professor about brainstem cavernomas? Yes, I have one. Hello. Yes, Dr. Hello, Roja, Sashin. can you introduce uh, yourself? Yes, I am Rolando Rojas. I am from Peru. I have to greet uh, Professor Nadja for your election, like uh, uh, the head of WFNS. Um, well, I have a question, and it's about what are your your message? Like, what kind of cavernomas, brainstem cavernomas, do you do not operate? So, I mean, uh, sometimes we find it in an MRI and we decide to operate, but what are your, your advice when do not operate brainstem cavernomas? Thank you. Okay, yeah, yeah, it's very important for a young neurosurgeon to know that because um, it's, it's, it's very challenging, it's very difficult surgery. It's, uh, as uh, I mentioned in my uh, talk and uh, it's just last the, the last two decades we uh, we uh, we we start to operate this uh, this uh, in this location, and for, in my opinion, the indication when the, there are symptomatic symptomatic uh, of course forms, we need to operate, and when the the, the situation and the brainstem is deep, is very is very difficult. We know that very well, but when it's superficial. Even if there is no, no, no uh, very important symptom, we, we, we can go to operate. But when, when the, the, the situation is deeply uh, located in the in brainstem, we need to, uh, ba to, 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 to see the balance between the complications and the situation of the patient. And the decision of the patient is very important in, this, in these cases. We need to have their consentment and their opinion because it's uh, it's not easy when the situation is really the, the cavernoma is is uh, situate, situate uh, is located very deeply. Those are, uh, in summarize, for me uh, and uh, my message is we can operate. We we, we do not operate when there is no symptom, of course, and when the the the, the cavernoma is uh, deeply located. Okay a small or a little bit uh, symptoms. I hope that I, uh, it's, uh, you are, uh, yes, my, my uh, yes. answer uh, convince you. I, I think it's a really good message because uh, we, we have many patients, uh, so we can review MRIs and incidentally we we'll find cavernomas. Sometimes the patient doesn't know it and we just propose sometimes because in, in your hands and, and in the hands of experts looks like easier uh, uh, take off a, a cover number, but it's not. And we have, we need experience also. We, you know, uh, uh, experts like you and no, have no more sometimes than more than 10, uh, 100 cases. So it's not uh, as usual to operate use this kind of uh, pathology. So uh, this, this was a, a really good message. Thank you, Professor Nadia, and congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, as I mentioned in my, my take home message, it's not daily uh, surgery. It's not daily surgery. It's, sur it's specific surgery, challenging, and dedicated uh, neurosurgeon is not uh, easy for all the neurosurgeons. We, we know that uh, uh, actually currently we need the sub, we, we need to be subspecialized in uh, in some fields because you cannot do everything very well not possible you have to choose the uh, your fields and you are, will be very dedicated devoted and you can I think with the, the, the dedication and the devotion you can uh, you can succeed thank you
Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Dr. Rojas. Dr. Rojas is our YNS member from the PAIL. Thank you, Dr. Rojas, for joining. Yes, Professor, you were saying something? Yes, yes, yes. Let's just thank you very much for your nice lectures. Uh, in, in Japan, we have uh, the more uh, endoscopic the procedure. Uh, it's uh, uh, entry point and also with navigation and monitoring and uh, very, very less invasive, just a two centimeter incision. So I, I think uh, in the future, so maybe especially the brain stem uh, cavern uh, I think uh, the more endoscopic procedure will be getting popular, I think. Anyway, but thank you very much for a nice uh, presentation tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you, Yoko, for this comment. Yeah, it's true because uh, uh, actually uh, uh, the endoscop endoscopy uh, will take place, uh, great place in neurosurgery. And uh, we saw many lesions uh, in the last uh, decade that uh, we never, uh, we never uh, can imagine, imagine that we can uh, operate some uh, lesion with endoscopy and we did it now easily. Maybe, maybe, I hope. In the, but the brainstem is very, very special. So endoscopy, directly endoscopy, we can use it with the microsurgery. I'm, con I'm convinced with that. We, we, but we hope in the future we can do it. <laughs> yes, thank it's you. The, it's the, it's the, it is the, 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 the roles of the new generation, young neuro, neurosurgeon yes, to, yes. to do that in the future. Yes. So young generation should, must uh, uh, learn how to use. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor. Definitely young generation will do it, but we need we do need a support and a mentorship from all the giants of neurosurgery like you. Absolutely right. And we Thank are you. here Thank you very and much. can count on our support and, and our, of course, uh, help. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question from the delegates or from the moderators for Professor? Dr. Liu, you want to say something? Dr. Liu is the chair of uh, ACNS YNS committee. Uh, hello, hello, Chanji. Uh, thank you, for Professor Najwa, for a very nice uh, presentation and congratulations to you, Professor. Uh, uh, my, my question, uh, Professor, because uh, there are, there are some, some speakers have uh, mentioned uh, previously in their lectures uh, regarding a subacute stage uh, where there is an obvious uh, halo sign around it, which are safer to go in for a brainstem carbonoma. What is your opinion, Professor? I'm, I'm so sorry, I don't hear you very well because there is some uh, cutting in your... Uh, in your uh... Yeah, I I'm, I'm apologize, uh, sorry. Professor. Uh, I think it's, yeah, uh, yeah, it's, I have, it's uh, uh, yeah, the connection is not. Uh, maybe, uh, yeah, Dr. Is it uh, Dr. Sashin, if you. Uh, if yeah, you, if I, you I, I think more. I got the question. I will repeat the question for Dr. Liu. But you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong. So, what he's trying to say is sometimes radiologically, when we see cavernomas, we see some hollow sign. Uh, high point density around this cover normal. I think he's trying to address it to the bleed. And generally, the, for the concept of uh, non brainstem cover normals, we go around the cover normals and we remove it. But for the brainstem cover normals, we generally dig into it and we remove it in piecemeal. So if you see this hollow sign, is it safer to go around the cover normal and remove it, or you still do it in the same technique like piecemeal dissection? Is that you want to ask, Dr. Liu? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. I think I mentioned that in my uh, my talk when I uh, I'm, when I'm uh, talking about the 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 te surgical technique. In this location, you have just uh, to remove the, the cavernoma and be uh, really very uh, precautions uh, about the 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 the, the gliosis, the, the gliosis or the, the ring of uh, bleeding uh, uh, around the, the cavernoma. You cannot touch it. You can let it there, it's not a problem. Because there is many, many discussion about this subject in the, and the controversies in the literature. Because some, some authors tell that we need to uh, uh, always uh, uh, remove all the gli gli gliosis, uh, peripheral gliosis around this, the, the cavernoma. But in this location, it's a very, very high functional area. And uh, the, the, you know, uh, 
my in my experience, not only in my experience and my in my opinion, but also in the literature, most of the the the, the neurosurgeon don't take who didn't take the uh, took the, the 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 peripheral gliosis or uh, gliosis or the ring of hemorrhage around the cavernoma. Only the cavernoma. It's more safer, and uh, the experience uh, show that. We, know, we, know, we are not, we are not uh, uh, it's not mandatory to go, uh, to, go to, uh, to um, remove this, uh, this uh, peripheral uh, gliosis. It's more gliosis than uh, really hemorrhage. Uh, sometimes because uh, the, the, the ring that you see in the MRI, it's included in the cavernoma, but there is some gly gliosis uh, around. I am uh, uh, talking about the gliosis. You cannot touch, you, 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 don't, you don't need to touch it. But the cavernoma, you can, if you, if usually uh, it's uh, the, the big size, you have to fragment it before to, to take it off. But sometimes when it's a small one, you can take it in, 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 one, in uh, one piece, in one piece. So it's not, it's not a mandatory to, to uh, yeah, to take off the, the gliosis uh, per, per, uh, around the, the cavernoma. This is my Thank opinion, you. and uh, I think it's, uh, I, in my experience, uh, I, uh, it's more safer for the patient. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Professor. Professor. Any other question or doubt from the delegates or from the panelists for Professor? Okay, then before going to the next lecture, I have two questions uh, at the last for Professor Najah El Abadi. One is if we have uh, certain countries uh, like of Afghanistan, Myanmar, and certain countries from South America and Caribbean, where the status of neurosurgical uh, care is still evolving. Brainstem covered normal treatment may not be available in this particular country. So uh, you being the president elect for 2021 and 23, what is your vision for this low and middle income countries? How do we bring up the neurosurgical care in these countries to a status that even they'll be able to operate brainstem cover no mass, one thing. And since we have most of us, the delegates and the panelists and the moderators in the today's uh, webinar are young neurosurgeons. Many of them, I'm sure, not never have operated brainstem cover no mass. So what is your message for them? If I have to operate brainstem cover no mass, my first case, which are the cases which I should choose, the blade one or the not blade one or any particular area, what is your advice for the young neurosurgeons to operate the first case of brainstem cavernoma? Thank you. Okay. Uh, for the first, the, my answer for the four uh, question as uh, president-elect of WFNS uh, for this uh, period, uh, in my program at uh, it's not only it's my program, it's my, my, it's my, uh, my deep thanks the th th thought that um, we need to help, of course, the the, the countries in need, as uh, as you, you as you mentioned, uh, in most uh, most of them are, uh, are in uh, in uh, Amer Latin America, in uh, Asia, in some countries in Asia, in Africa, and uh, uh, of course uh, the first thing that we uh, we will in my program at, uh, to help this, uh, this area in need of neurosurgery, to develop more neurosurgery, more number of number of neurosurgeons, but also not only the number, but also the, 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 the training of the, of, of, of the, of this, this neurosurgeon, this area. And this is, we will do it by, by of course, uh, uh, training and cooperation with the, between the low, the high, uh, high income countries and low and middle countries. It's very important. And the, some missions, of course, uh, leading by the WFNS to uh, some uh, countries in the need, and uh, also by uh, by the foundation to help young neurosurgeon to have some uh, some or oh, some. Uh, Fellow to go the, in the in the in the in the countries who can uh, train in this uh, in some fields uh, special fields, and uh, uh, the, for the t t your my my message for the young neurosurgeon who would like to start uh, with this surgery, we need to start with the simple case, and in my opinion, the simple case is when you have, for example. Uh, 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 like tumor, you know, pseudotumoral uh, cavernomas, uh, super superficial, of course, 
in the fourth ventricle and the pons is the first is the is the it is the easier cases that we, we, we can start with. But after that, you, you can, uh, when you are more uh, comfortable with this, uh, the, this uh, type of cavernoma in, in, uh, in brainstem, you can go, uh, you know, uh, slowly, step by step to the, the other's location as uh, anteriorly in the pons, the mesencephal, or uh, the medulla oblonga is usually uh, easy. When, when you do, of course, the the the, the, the cavernoma and the pons, and we know, uh, as I mentioned in my my talk, the the most look the most uh, number uh, located in the pons, not in mesencephal, unfortunately, and the pons uh, uh, usually posteriorly more than anteriorly, so it's more easy to go posteriorly, and when there are like tumor. Because when there is hemorrhage, there is a, a lot of uh, damage uh, by the bleeding. So it's the case uh, where you are not comfortable and the, the, to start with this. You need to start with the cases with which we, we will have a, a good outcome. It's more operation. This is my, my message for the young neurosurgeon who will start uh, uh, this surgery. Yes, certainly, Professor. Uh, Okay, then, uh, Professor Yogokato, if there are no questions, can we go for the next talk? Okay. Okay, your audio can is you muted. Me? Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yeah. thank yeah. you. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you. All so the best much. for your future thank career. You. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you thank so you. much for, for your you very much. presentation. I'm so sorry I have to go. I I'm, uh, I'm apologize for, um, for the next speaker because I had my mom is, uh, is hospitalized and I, I need to go to see her. So sorry. I'm really, um, I apologize. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank, Bye. Thank, Bye. Nice Bye. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Bye. So with that, uh, we'll go ahead with our next talk. And uh, I think we'll concentrate more on the discussion. So I'll keep the introduction very, very short. So in today's time, uh, for every young neurosurgeon, it is very important to have good control on the spine surgery also. And today we have a Professor Takeshi Hara, who is the successor of Professor Yuko Obara, and uh, who is uh, working at the Department of Neurosurgery and uh, Spine and Spinal Cord Center at, at Juntendo University School of Medicine, Japan. And he is going to talk uh, with us about the concept and practice of spine surgery for accurate diagnosis and accurate treatment with the topic which I'm sure uh, every young neurosurgeon would be needing. So before starting, I would uh, request uh, Professor Federico and uh, Dr. Hugo, please, uh, uh, can you say a few words about the spine surgery and uh, Dr. Hugo? All right, um, I think this is a very important topic um, when you're starting your career as a neurosurgeon because we know around 70% of the pathologies that we see as a surgeon is the spine or at least the beginning of your career and then uh, you can further develop into uh, different practice either spine or skull base or a vascular surgery so this is it's important to have an overview for young neurosurgeons on this um, aspect thank you thank you dr yes. Hugo. <clears throat> i absolutely agree we all know that spine surgery is maybe yes, 60 or 70% of our work. Many of these patients have chronic pain and this is all, that's also a difficult thing to manage. It's not always easy to know when to operate, when not to operate. If the patient keeps coming and complaining and you're not very sure about um, the surgical indication. So I think this is a uh, a very well chosen topic and congratulations for that and please go ahead with, with your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Over to you, uh, Professor Takeshi Hara. You can start your talk, please. Okay. I share my... I share my screen.
Yes, it's visible from there. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, good mo good morning and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Takeshi Hara from Juntendo University in Japan. Uh, thank you for very much for Dr. Uh, Sachin Shame and Dr. Kato for giving me this opportunity. Today, I'd like to talk about concept and practice spine surgery. In our opinion, the three most important factors in recent spinal surgery are accurate diagnosis, safe procedure, and minimally invasive surgery. At our institution, we adhere to these concepts in our surgery, and these are not independent factors, but each of them is complementary to the other. Without accurate diagnosis, the wrong treatment will be chosen. And without pinpoint diagnosis, the cause of symptom, uh, minimally invasive treatment cannot be performed. In today's lecture, I'd like to explain what we consider to be the important factor in spine surgery uh, by presenting cases. First of all, first of all I, I will explain the importance of accurate diagnosis by presenting cases. Why do we need to evaluate the neurological findings slowly? One reason is estimate where the region is located. By properly, properly evaluating the neurological findings, it's possible to ascertain at which level of the cervical, uh, thoracic, or uh, lumbar spine the region is located, and whether the region uh, identified on imaging studies is the cause of the patient's symptom. We also need to estimate what the pathology is and, and whether the region is in the spinal cord or in the rest of the nervous system. All of this can be said to avoid misdiagnosis. Through evaluation of the neurological findings is of utmost importance to determine the cause of the symptoms. A spinal, often spinal cord diseases are not the cause of the symptoms, even though they are considered abnormal on, ima abnormal on imaging tests such as MRI, and it may not be clearly depicted by existing imaging tests. The goal is not to correct the imaging findings, but to eliminate the symptoms. The following is a list of the main findings that we focused on. We will not go into the details of the examination, but by evaluating these findings, we can make a diagnosis of affected level. We will also evaluate whether the symptoms are myopathy or arteriopathy. I will present a case in which accurate diagnosis was important. The patient is a 62-year-old female with left leg pain. Uh, pain was recognized from the outer side of the left thigh to the outer side of the lower leg. There was no evidence of back, back pain, but, but, but straight leg raising test and camp test, camp sign, and fe femoral nerve stress test were positive, and L5 nerve root block was effective. A myography showed L4-5 medial disc and L5-S1 lateral disc. In both cases, the L5 nerve root is injured. Which disc is the cause of the pain? This patient has no back, back pain, but severe lower, lower limb pain. And pain enhancement in supine position was observed. A camp sign positive. Based on these findings, left L5-S1 lateral disc herniation was diagnosed. We performed endoscopic discectomy by posterior lateral approach. These discs were removed piece by piece. After operation, her pain was disappeared. Identifying region based on neurological examination is an indispensable approach as a neurosurgeon. A 56-year-old male presented with sudden onset of urinary retention. Muscle weakness in both lower limbs were also observed. An MRI of the lumbar spine showed multiple coda equina tumors. The findings of this case clearly showed increased deep tendon reflex in the lower limbs, a symptom that does not occur in coda equina tumors. 
The rapid onset of symptoms was also unlikely to be caused of cold ignorance in tumors. The thoracic spine MRI was performed again and showed an epidural hematoma. This was thought to be the cause of urinary retention. Fortunately, the patient's neurological symptoms were rapidly improving and he was placed under observation. The hematoma was spontaneously absorbed. Thus, using imaging findings alone as a basis for diagnosis may lead to errors in diagnosis. It is important to focus on the neurological findings as a basis for diagnosis. Uh, this case was a 73-year-old man who presented with numbness in both lower extremities. MRI showed an intradural extramedullary tumor at the level of the thoracic spine. He was scheduled for surgery, uh, but within the two days, urinary retention progressed rapidly. However, uh, there was little change in muscle strength in both lower limbs, and no pathological reflex were observed. The neuro neuro neurological findings have not changed since first medical examination. With a markedly elevated inflammatory response on blood tests and an enlarged prostate on CT, we were able to diagnose the cause of urinary retention as acute prostatitis uh, rather than a tumor. If the initial neurological evaluation had been neglected, the diagnosis could not have been made and inappropriate treatment could have been administered. Urinary retention was relieved by antibiotics. These are the most common imaging tests performing for spinal cord diseases. In recent years, the development of various imaging methods using MRI has made it possible to evaluate the pathophysiology of many spinal diseases. However, is MRI the best diagnostic tool? It's important to understand the characteristics of these tests and to perform imaging tests. With the advent of MRI, the diagnosis of spinal cord disease has become easier. It's possible to detect regions using a variety of imaging test methods. However, the spine is a moving structure and MRI is usually unable to evaluate its dynamics. Also, it can only, only evaluate the supine position. If this is not kept in mind when evaluating it, the images based on the neurological symptoms, uh, the diagnosis may be incorrect. Uh, this is a 78-year-old female with progressive myelopathy uh, based on the MRI only. The spinal cord compression is very mild and does not seem to be abnormal. So the patient may be misdiagnosed with other diseases instead of cervical spondylosis. When the myogram is performed and the extension, uh, extension neck and the CT scan is taken, it can be clearly seen that the spinal cord is being compressed. We must realize that the spine, unlike the cranium, is affected by moving like this case. A 72-year-old female uh, with progressive gait disturbance and was the main symptom. This is a dural AVF case, but uh, MRI shows there is no flow void. Extensive high signal areas are seen in spinal cord. Uh, the patient was referred by a neurologist due to lack of diagnosis. In this case, myography uh, clearly showed dilated blood vessels. MRI did not show these findings. Since vascular malformation was considered, angiography was performed. Angiography showed a feeder in the left radicular medullary artery. We performed embolization with NBCL. Her symptom was improved. Although the opportunity to perform myography is limited due to the effectiveness of MRI, it's a good idea to consider performing myography for pathologies of which the cause cannot be determined by MRI. It's important to realize that modern MRI is not automatically superior to old fashioned myography. Next, I'd uh, like to talk about the uh, safe procedure. In recent years, 
the techniques of using navigate, navigation to safely insert screws has become more popular. Navigation systems have been widely used in brain surgery for a long time. However, the spine is a mobile structure and its alignment and shape are affect, affected by the surgical position. With our arm, Images are acquired interoperatively and using for navigation, which increasing accuracy and eliminates the need for registration. This can be used not only for ordinary pedicle screws, but also for procedures such as S2 other iliac screws, uh, which may cause serious complications depending on the screw position and insertion direction. In recent years, there are products that allow navigation to be attached to the drill itself to ensure a safely while drilling. This makes it possible to see where you are operating uh, while drilling. Sorry. Using the device, uh, we have reported a safer way to insert the Magal screw in the world neurosurgery. This is a 72-year-old male with progressing myelopathy due to atlant axial dislocation. Computed tomography reconstruction of the right C12 complex demonstrated a right high riding VA. A screw trajectory is precisely created using a drill in combination with horoscopic na and navigation. A brand tip guide wire uh, then is placed in a uh, created trajectory a tapping is performed through the guide wire and the screw is pressed. The trajectory is created while feeding, feeling the bone being drilled. So the possibility of anterior, anterior breaching can be minimized. Uh, this is a 52 year old female with atlantraxial dislocation and C5-6 cervical spondylosis. Her back pain and lower body numbness markedly aggravated by neck flexion. Uh, so we diagnose uh, AAD is the cause of symptom. Uh, from the anterior side, a dental screw and anterior transarticular screw fixation were performed under drill navigation as well. And both could be performed safely. And this is a case of OPLL in a 55-year-old man who developed myelopathy after a minor trauma. Uh, he had severe anterior compression and we considered performing anterior decompression. In such cases, the drill can be used and the navigation to safely, safely remove the ossified region. And there are some pitfalls of navigation guided surgery, except for the vertebral with reference misalignment due to rotation or sinking can occur. And further the operating site is from the reference, uh, the greater the discrepancy with the navigation. So when manipulating multiple vertebra, uh, the upper uh, the lower vertebra should be limited to two and manipulate the vertebra far from the reference first and do not operate the upper and lower vertebra together, which may cause instability. If a long tool is bent, it may look like uh, going in a crazy direction. So make sure it's in a stable direction. Uh, then uh, the last section, I'll talk about minimally invasive surgery. Uh, the approach to the anterior lumbar spine had changed dramatically with the advent of air lift. In the past, a wide lateral abdominal incision was made and the intra-abdominal organs were detracted and exposed. But with the advent of o lift and x lift a minimally invasive approach has become possible. One of the advantages of air lift is in indirect decompression. The compression occurs when a large diameter cage is inserted to the intervertebral space and lifting the intervertebral space and stretching the buckling ligaments. Uh, this is called ligament taxis. One of the advantages of airlift is that the collective force is stronger than conventional methods. When intervertebral mobility is maintained, 
The insertion of a large diameter cage into the intervertebral space provides a strong collective force. In this case, a leaf was applied to multiple intervertebral spaces and was able to achieve approximately 50 degree of kyphosis. Uh, we present a case uh, where a leaf uh, was applied to tumor removal. A uh, 28-year-old woman came to see uh, with a chief complaint of left thigh pain. Uh, MRI showed left intrapsoas tumor. The pain was so severe that she could not sleep at night and was in constant, constant pain. We decided to use the exif approach to reach the tumor and remove it. Uh, after considering less invasive approaches. The tumor was exposed uh, when the iliosoas muscle was incised. An incision was made uh, through the capsule of the tumor and intercapsular removal was completed. Post-operative imaging shows that tumor had been removed. Next, I'd like to talk about FAD, uh, which we are also actively working on. Uh, there is a transforaminal approach or posterolateral post approach in which an endoscope is inserted percutaneously uh, into the intervertebral disc and the interlaminar approach in which the lamina is partially removed to reach the spinal, spinal canal. In recent years, percutaneous uh, endoscopic surgery has evolved to include a variety of percutaneous due to the wider range usage of drills uh, that can be used. As a result, the name of the percutaneous has changed from full endoscopic lumbar disectomy to full endoscopic spinal surgery, FESS. Uh, this case was a 70-year-old woman as a patient underwent lumbar interbody fusion at the L34 level at another hospital. And afterwards, the right leg pain recurred after a fall. The patient had right back pain and lower extremity pain in the right L4 region. And L4, L4 nerve root broke is effective. However, the imaging findings shows uh, the root was slightly compressed at the right intervertebral foramen, but it was difficult to evaluate due to artifacts. How to treat it? Uh, should we add the T lip at L45? Uh, we performed foraminoplasty by partial resection of superior articular process of L5. The disc was resected and the L4 root was confirmed to be decompressed. Postoperatively, the patient's lower extremity pain disappeared. Uh, it should be remembered that in lumbar disc herniation, the affected nerve root is different when the herniation is located within the intervertebral foramen and lateral to the spinal cord, despite the same level of pathology. Before surgery, it's important to properly evaluate that this level is causing the symptoms. In this figure, L4-5 disc herniation would be L5 symptoms for central or paramedian disc, and L4 symptoms for far lateral or foraminal type. This is a cautionary point in lumbar spinal stenosis and lumbar spondylar resthesis. Uh, as it's well known, the symptoms uh, intermittent claudication and sciatica and weakness and bladder bowel dysfunction. We need to evaluate whether the symptoms are due to central canal stenosis uh, or lateral recess or uh, foraminal stenosis. Based on this diagnosis, if the cause of the symptom can be identified, minimally invasive treatment can be performed with FESS. Uh, finally, we have been performing endoscopic odontoidectomy. My mentor, uh, Dr. Ohara, reported this technique in neurospine. Uh, this is a 40-year-old woman with myopathy and brainstem dysfunction. The MRI showed a very strong anterior compression of the odontoid. Even after OC fixation, 
the symptoms did not improve due to anterior compression of odont odontoid, and odontoidectomy was performed. Fluoroscopy was used in combination with endoscope. The post-operative image shows uh, the tip of the odontoid has been removed, dissected, and the compression has been released. Finally, I'd like to express my gratitude to Dr. Satin Shemat and Dr. Kato for giving me this opportunity. I'm also happy to have had the opportunity to inter interact with doctors from Afghanistan and Myanmar. Uh, I'd like to contribute continue to share my experience for the benefit of Asian neurosurgeon and Caribbean and uh, South American uh, neurosurgeon. Uh, these are take home message in this lecture. The most important factor in the diagnosis and treatment of spinal disease is a through evaluation of the neurological findings. Based on the neurological findings, the pathology should be understood and appropriate treatment should be selected in agreement with the imaging findings. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. That was an excellent lecture for all the young neurosurgeons, especially the residents of young neurosurgery, of residents of neurosurgery. I would request Dr. Yogo and Dr. Pedrico to uh, make comment on this lecture, please. Um, yeah, hi. That was a great talk. and. Um, uh, there was important message that we have to evaluate and we have to know exactly what is the pathology causing and not just to operate the images that is some of the problems that we have during during our career. Um, I'm not the person to talk about the procedures because I'm not a spine surgeon so I don't know maybe um, Dr. Federico can can talk about some about this topic. Yeah, well, congratulations also for your for your talk. And yes, it is very important to examine the patient and not to operate an MRI. You need to operate a patient, not an image. So I wanted to ask you what you think about cervical disc herniation when you when you decide to operate. Do you always put an um, an intersomatic fusion cage or do you perform sometimes a simple disectomy? Because that has been an issue of a, um, conflict and, and discussion lately. What do you think? Uh, uh, when diagnosing the cervical disc herniation, uh, firstly, uh, we, are, we treated a conservative management uh, for uh, three, three months. Then the symptoms was, uh, remained. Uh, we are choosing the uh, surgical block or uh, surgical uh, surgery. Uh, we are ordinarily performing the uh, anterior spinal uh, discectomy and fusion uh, for treating the uh, anterior decompression, anterior decompression, anterior decompression. Uh, and but uh, the treatment selection is uh, different from uh, the symptom uh, of myelopathy or radiculopathy, I think. Uh, if radiculopathy, uh, the cases are very limited, the uh, posterior endoscopic uh, flaminoplasty uh, to using the endoscope uh, may select, uh, partially select, I think so. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Federico. Uh, any other question from the panelists or delegates or from the moderators? Yes, Sashin, I have a e, Dr. E is there from Myanmar. Dr. Shri E? Sure, sure. Please go ahead. Uh, Professor Takeshi, I. Uh, uh, really, really good presentation. Thank you for that. Uh, I have a question. What do you think about uh, the use of uh, sagittal balance? So it, it's uh, like uh, uh, sometimes we 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 uh, we decide uh, how to what to do to, with patient with about sagittal balance in lumbar spine. What do you think about it? Uh, 
Uh, this is a very uh, important factor for sagittal balance in the uh, rumba uh, rumba fixation surgery. Uh, we are the uh, we are routinely uh, uh, evaluate the sagittal balance uh, when uh, global global uh, global uh, sorry uh, global imaging of uh, X-ray. Uh, we are. Uh, my in my uh, institute uh, the eos eos the whole spine whole spine uh, x-ray to evaluate the sagittal balance to uh, determine the uh, fixation levels and the correct or not correct uh, we are uh, uh, routinely evaluated the rumba spine thank you thank you thank you very much professor but any other question from the panelists or delegates? Dr. Karin, Dr. Karin Aponte, are you there? Hi, Dr. Karin is there from Bolivia. Welcome, Dr. Karin. Can you introduce yourself and ask questions? You have to, uh, you have to unmute yourself. Oh, hi, I am Karin Aponte. I am from Bolivia. Hi. Uh, from Santa Cruz de la Sierra, Bolivia. Uh, just only a, a question, Dr. Takeshi, uh, in your opinion, what part it uh, was the most complicated? In uh, the uh, most complicated surgery? Yes. Uh, uh, that's a difficult question. Uh, complicated the uh, eyes. Uh, in my opinion, uh, the uh, degenerative scoliosis of rumba spine uh, is a very complicated surgery for me uh, because uh, many points of uh, considering points such as uh, global alignment and uh, uh, global alignment is so and alignment so and uh, fixation level where where. Uh, the anterior, hmm? uh, which levels uh, to fixate, fixate the lumbar spine or uh, addi additioning the uh, sacral or iliac. Uh, and some very <laughs> multiple, multiple point to considering is uh, to in, in lumbar spine in a surgery. I think so, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, you. Dr. Karin, for joining. Uh, well, I have a question. Do you have any experience, Professor, on robotic surgery in spine? Ah. Because robotic surgery in spine is quite coming up, okay. and especially for the cervical spine, where yeah. we're putting the pedicle screw in the cervical spine or the CV junction. As you mentioned, for CV junction, you mentioned a good uh, case report of a navigation-guided transarticular screws. The robotic makes that quite easy. So, you have any experience on robotic spine surgeries? Uh, uh, in, uh, I have no experience in robotic spine surgery. Uh, but uh, uh, last year, uh, I uh, go to the America, uh, not uh, America, and watching the <laughs> only watching the uh, demonstration of Medotronic Mesor. Uh, uh, okay. So uh, we, I am not uh, experienced uh, robotic surgery, but uh, I have been interested in the robotic surgery very, uh, very well. So uh, I hope uh, the robot robot is uh, coming in Japan. Uh, so, okay, thank you, thank you very much. Any other questions from the delegates? If no questions, then uh, we will uh, close this session. Uh, may I request Professor Yoko Kato to say a few words before we close the session? Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hara. So maybe I, I think in Japan, uh, uh, you mentioned about uh, scoliosis. Is it uh, the neurosurgeon's work or also PDX work? No. Uh, what percentage done by neurosurgeon uh, for the moment in Japan now? Uh, okay. Uh, sorry, I don't know the percentage of uh, scoliosis surgery in the uh, orthopedics or neurosurgeon. Uh, 
uh, mainly a uh, neuro uh, orthopedic surgeon uh, uh, surgery uh, performing the scoliosis surgery uh, in Japan, I think so. So, uh, but uh, uh, orthopedic surgery surgeon uh, has many experience and techniques uh, that we have uh, the neurosurgeon neurosurgeon not to have techniques. So, I think, uh, but. Uh, the, the technique is very important to uh, correct the scoliosis uh, and the long fusion techniques. Uh, I, I want to learn the techniques, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. You demonstrate the endoscopic pro procedure. Yeah. I think it's very, very, very the minimally invasive for the patient. And the, that is a future treatment, I think. Thank you so much. And uh, I think uh, the today's uh, two uh, the big lectures were excellent. I think uh, uh, so. The uh, I think for awareness that you should learn about uh, uh, more uh, anatomical things, even the uh, remote place. I think uh, of course uh, uh, through the internet or video or uh, whatever. I think uh, you can learn uh, so many things uh, with those uh, uh, materials. But uh, I think uh, also the another option is to learn with video. Uh, you can get more videos. Of course, uh, uh, ACNS, we have so many collected uh, the video series that we can provide the, uh, the remote place that if you wish that we can send. And I, I think uh, uh, anatomy is the most important, I think. So that then uh, step by step you can learn how to, to treat or the, uh, with uh, uh, theoretical things. Uh, I think both uh, lectures are the totally different uh, uh, topics, but I think uh, it's very very interesting that we uh, we can learn so many things uh, from two big the giant the, the professors. Thank you so much. And also the Dr. Hugo, and also the. Uh, 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 Fernando, or oh, thank you very much Rico. for uh, thank you very much uh, from the Latin America. Uh, the Hugo is uh, working at the China now, but uh, you originally from uh, Venezuela, I heard. So I, I think uh, that as uh, as in, yes, we can uh, support your country. The, the initially that we uh, planned maybe several years back, but uh, at that time, so some. Uh, uh, collapse of the, the economy. So the uh, but the, today is the first time to have such a uh, idea because uh, uh, I, I think. In, in yeah. Future, thank you very much for yes. the invitation. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So in the future, we we will have a more and more uh, get the YNS uh, from uh, from Latin America or uh, the Caribbean or. Of course, uh, still we are continuing uh, support of the Afghanistan or Myanmar, uh, some remote place. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor Kato, for the effort you are doing. And it's Sunday, and I know this is very important for, for Latin American neurosurgeons. So thanks again for your effort. So we'll visit your uh, Uruguay once again. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining. I have two announcements to make before we uh, wind up our session. So our next uh, our next webinar, our next webinar will be on the 14th of November. And the speaker for the next webinar will be uh, Professor Raghunath Kandasamy from Malaysia, who's going to talk about supraorbital eyebrow approaches, the technique and nuances, one of the minimally invasive uh, microsurgical approaches, which uh, young neurosurgeon must know about, and uh, Professor Ali Sultan from uh, USA, who is going to talk about skull-based surgery. So that will be the next session on 14th of November. We'll meet at the same time, uh, 19, 19.30, that is 7.30 Japan Standard Time. And I think this is around 6.30 in uh, Latin America and Caribbean. So that shouldn't be a problem. Or is it too early? Dr. Karim, in 6.30, Dr. Rojas, in 6.30, okay, or is it too early? It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. okay. No problem. So, okay, okay. Okay, because two different time zones. Here it is evening, time to sleep, and there you're just starting your day. 
So <laughs> thank you very much. I think we had a wonderful webinar today. Uh, we had two excellent speakers. One, our Dr. Professor Najee al the the next uh, WFNS uh, president-elect who spoke uh, and gave us a good knowledge about the brainstem cover noma and quite an interactive session after that. And definitely a, a must needed tips for the young neurosurgeon about the spine surgery by uh, Professor Takeshi Hara. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yugo and Professor Federico for uh, chairing the session. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Karin Naponte from Bodavia, Dr. Nujerling from Dominican Republic, Dr. Maria from Uruguay, and Dr. Rojas from uh, Peru for actively participating and moderating this session. And thank you very much, Dr. Liu Abun Singh, who's the chair of the ACNS Finance Committee, and Dr. Sharon, who's the chair of BIN Committee for being with me as a, a co-host. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we can wind up this session. All right. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Have, thank you. Bye. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hugo, for joining. Thank you. Thank you, Sachi. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Sharon? You. Dr. Shri, you are from Myanmar. Why you didn't speak today? <laughs> <laughs> He's a hybrid Thank neurosurgery you. surgeon from Myanmar who's training in Japan, right? Well, it's good. Yes. Uh, nice say. to see you. <laughs> okay. You can say you can say some word. Few words, please. <laughs> Uh, and thank you so much for uh, like uh, we we can learn a lot from that online and uh, especially during this difficult time. So thank you so much for uh, uh, doing this kind of the very lectures. Thank you. Thank you. Best wishes to thank your you life in, in Japan. Doctor Yusta, are you there? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, for joining. Sure. We'll see you at the end of the webinar. So next time it will be on 14th of November and we'll start at 6.30 uh, uh, the Latin American time. So please join us uh, on next Sunday. Uh, Prashant or uh, who's there? Prashant or uh, Rohit? Hello? Who's there from technical team? Prashant, Rohit? Okay, we'll close the meeting. <laughs>